Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 624. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the duke of you know, the salt of the strategery, the indestructible bridge-defying, is trying to see if the squirrel in his backyard will become his Jerry-like sidekick, much to the dismay of his neighbors. So says the elder statesman of the podcast, Sagulin. How's it going, eh? <laughs> Jim, on this episode, we're going to talk about Wonder Woman Historia, the Amazons, book one. We're also going to talk about Wonder Girl issue number six as we continue our two-part exploration of the Wonder Woman Amazons universe. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what is going on over at DCBService.com? Well, over at DCBS, we've got the new champions of Shazam! Nope, didn't work. Dang it. Issue number one, that's forty percent <laughs> off, only two thirty nine. But we also have um, twelve issue series, uh, the Monkey Prince, issue number one, cool. uh, also forty percent off, uh, two ninety nine. So thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, I want to shout out the Bequest trade paperback. We talked a while back with longtime friend of the show, Freddie E. Williams II, about this wonderful creator-owned series that he did with Tim Seeley. It's collected now. It's sixteen ninety nine regularly, thirty percent off. Only eleven eighty nine. You can collect the whole mini series in one cool bundle. Over at uh, Fables, we've got the Fables Convendium Trade Paperback Volume Four. Fifty nine ninety nine regularly, forty two percent off. Only thirty four seventy nine. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for the savings and continuing to support our show. Mister Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Should old warnings be forgot? Raging Bullets is a spoiler show <laughs> with plotline twists and what not to what tish. And you know, we go in depth into the books we review on the show. So if you haven't read them, come back later to enjoy the show. <laughs> Let's do <make> some comics. <laughs> Through the magic alchemy of nature's most awesome sources of energy, Ray Palmer, atomic physicist, becomes the Atom. Our first discussion this episode is going to be of Wonder Woman Historia Book One, The Amazons. Kelly Sue DeConnick is the writer. Phil Jimenez is the artist. Hi-Fi, Arif Priantano and Romolo Fajarado Jr. on colors. Apologies for any name butchery there. Clayton Cowles on letters. Phil Jimenez and Romulo Fajarado Jr. I know I butcher his name. Cover artists. Oliver Copiel and Alex Sinclair on the variant covers. The editors are Chris Conroy and Andy Corey. Andrea Shea, associate editor. Darren Robinson, publication design. Danielle DeGrad is the publication production and apologies again for any name butchery on this i definitely want to shout out the creative on this one this was such a nice surprise i knew i I knew this was coming out but i didn't know much about it other than the fact that you know it was going to be this prestige format book telling uh, the history of the amazons i had no idea where the story was going to go and man does this really set up an expansion of the lore there's things that we already know that are further clarified there's things that we didn't know that were put out there that obviously are going to play a lot more into the future of the amazons i think this 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 tome um this first book of this i can't wait for like volume two right now which is coming in spring was such a pleasant surprise so well crafted the artwork is stunning uh, it's it's a different level Phil Jimenez uh, artwork, uh, especially being done for something like this and, and the whole art team that put this together, really has crafted something special here. This is well worth, like when they said the next issue's coming in spring, bring out that next issue whenever you want if it's going to be <laughs> this kind of quality, because this is going to be a read again and again kind of book. Um, it could, I'm going to page through this for art. I'm going to read it again because of the quality story. And that's really the nice thing. The lore that it really gives was intriguing. I loved seeing, you know, because it's not a big focus. We don't see Wonder Woman. Well, we we kind of do. We kind of see Wonder <laughs> Woman in this. Uh, and uh, we get to see Hippolyta in a very different light. Um, some history of Hippolyta that I didn't know. 
uh, which was really great. But a lot more focus on the gods, a lot more focus on the first round of Amazons. And I was gripped by this. Uh, it was something really, really surprising for me. If you miss this, it's definitely worth picking up and it's worth the price point. This is a quality book. I loved it. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're in the same place. <laughs> Yeah, you know me. You yeah. know me well. This yeah. was absolutely wonderful read. And I, and everything you're saying is funny. Everything you're saying about the artwork, I'm just completely echoing you on that. It's you know, it's funny. I, we do we read everything on our iPads and our eyes and my iZilla. And I'll be honest with you, the iZilla didn't really do this justice. I you need the big oversized format to really and just you know, it, it looks beautiful in my on izilla but i'll tell you that oversized large i i just want this monster coffee book size tome is what i want out of this thing just because of the artwork because of the detail because everything that this this look to it i'm like this is an absolutely beautiful book but it's also a really cool story i yeah. think that is something that it's really is something that completely catch caught me off guard yeah when you know, we saw the advertisement first. Like, I knew I'd pick it up because I'm right now very Wonder Woman happy. I'm like, oh, that'd be kind of neat. Let's see what this history is and all that. And as soon as I started reading, I was like, oh my god, this is awesome. You know, and it's you know completely. It's one of those joyful surprises sometimes when you pick up a book that you don't realize how how good it's going to be, how epic it's going to be, how beautiful the artwork, how cool the story is going to be. You know, that complete surprise out of nowhere for me. And I think that is the biggest joy I'm getting from rereading and re reading and rereading and just doing my art read throughs, just going through nice and slow and looking at the stuff, just looking at these images. It's absolutely wonderful. Do you have this in, do you have this in paper? Not yet. That's the thing. I'm like, I, I, cause I only picked it up uh, digitally cause that's how I, that's my primary read now. And I'm like, I should have gotten this in the uh, format. I, and see, I, I have this one. In, I have both. I have, I have a digital and paper. And it's, it, you make some interesting points there. And they're accurate, actually. Uh, and I'm not saying that surprisingly. Um, it's some books, I digital paper, I don't really care. This was one, I read it digitally first. I don't, it really drew me to read it in the paper. There's some, it visually is different on paper. Yeah. It's, it's hard to describe. The colors pop a little differently. This is one I love. Listen, I I don't regret my purchase having it on the iPad. It's great to have it there, but this one reads. There's something special about this one in paper. <laughs> yeah. and we don't it, like it. To me, it's usually six and one half dozen. The other, I like. You were talking about larger format, which I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about. Boy, I hope this thing gets collected in an absolute. And I can't imagine it not with the fact that there's such an art focus. And it looks like every issue is going to have that. Uh, so I agree with that. But this is this is one uh, I urge people go to your comic shop, grab this one. This one's one that it's worth having in paper. It's it's a good looking book in paper. It's and there's a there's a it, there is a difference. <laughs> um, and I'm not usually the, I'm usually one that eh, I can go either way. This one is there's I like it better in paper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I, I've shifted for towards more towards the digital. Mm -hmm. you know, I still have my uh, titles that I get on. Uh, yeah, you know, I get paper on, and but it's you know, and a lot of the collected stuff and those kind of things I'll get some variant covers I pick up, mm -hmm. and you know, in the paper format. But this book, I'll tell you, um, as soon as I started reading, I'm like, man, I need to get this. I, I need to get a physical copy in hand. On this one, just because I think it is, I keep I, I want this absolute. Actually, I want it larger than absolute. Yeah, I, I want this coffee book, uh, coffee uh, uh, you know table size. You know, kind of one of those big over oversized uh, tomes because I think that will really do this artwork justice. You know, and just the level of detail. I'm just, just wait, Hold on, I got to stop you for a second. I'm just picturing you with this book like you can crawl on. <laughs> Exactly. Like, dude, I want this. Give me the six foot tall version where, like, I need to be on my second floor in order to read it. Exactly. Man. I, I, I want this. Have to, I want to have to put this on my kitchen table, you know, and have it span from one side of the cable table to the other. You know, when the book's open, that's the size I want on this. 
I want. I don't want a coffee table book. I want a kitchen table. I want a dining room table, extended leaf, spread out, uh, seats twelve people, uh, table book. That's what I want. I want to get rid of a couch in order to have this book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on the artwork, though. And honestly, it's one of the few t- I'm usually in. I love the digital format, too. Uh, I, we kind of collect similarly these days. I'm buying just as much paper, but my focus is a lot more on omnibuses, absolute editions, deluxe editions, um, the collector's editions that they've been putting out there. Um, I'm particularly liking in the deluxe, uh, the Vertigo collections that have been coming out, like Fables and stuff like that, 100 Bullets and Sandman. They've been collecting in these these deluxe formats. Why the Last Man, they did it with as well. Um, which is funny because I've got some of the ones that I'm referencing there. I actually have an absolute as well. But I like the deluxe edition format for uh, reading copies. Um, and it's uh, really cool. But that's how I'm doing a lot of my paper now. So I'm not necessarily spending less on paper i'm just buying differently because i i'm into collections and that's kind of where it's at but uh, this was one on a whim i ended up grabbing it in paper because it's normally something i would have bought digitally and it's making me realize i've got to be really paying a lot more attention to the artwork associated with the book when I make those decisions, because this was one, there's a different pop. <laughs> and that was, yeah. it's, so I do urge everyone out there, if you got this digitally, not, I'm not being a snob when it comes to that. I'm, it's more of a, you'll see it. It's kind of a different sort of flavor to it. I actually like having both versions, um, where my digital is kind of my reader copy now. And the, um, the paper is my art copy just cause it looks really good. This was a great book. what do you think of the story? Was this like what you expected or was it, um, was this the route that you expected this to go? Were you expecting something different? And what what did you think of that? One hundred percent, completely swerved. One hundred percent swerved for me. And I think that that again, it's you know, as I said, when I first started seeing this artwork, like, oh my god! And then you get into the story, you're like, this is awesome. You know, just because it was complete, I did not think I had this history in my head of what who the Amazons are and all that. This completely threw that out the window for me, and I love that. I love the fact that I completely. What you, especially what you said about Hippolyta, we see a completely different story for Hippolyta, you know. But we do see the Hippolyta we know come, you know, kind of the, the, the fight. The last page of this book, we see the glimpse of the, the Hippolyta you and I both know. And I'm like, that is cool. And again, the direct, you know, the level of interaction of the gods, I think, is even more, you know, than what I what I've had in my head as towards the history of the Amazon. Mm-hmm. You know, I always saw the Amazons as being the Amazons and then the gods kind of they, you know, they honor the gods, but the gods did, did nothing for them. Here we're directly seeing they were birthed by the gods. The gods actually created our, the Amazons that we know. And I thought that was a really neat little twist to this, that it's this is more of a 100 percent direct connection to the gods direct connection to um, them you know and you know towards who the amazons are i thought that yeah it was kind of a neat little twist to it and again the this was a heavy gods focused story so you see kind of the the uh, the uneasiness uh, that goes on in olympus as well so i was like that you know i always like those kind of political intrigue kind of stuff with the gods and then you have these amazons who are just once again complete you know you know Hardcore, you know, so we get some really groovy kill scenes. We get a really nice body count. We get a nice, you know, gore, nice, beautiful violence, that that art and pageantry of combat. You know, they capture that well here, but it wasn't like this wasn't just a kill them all book. This had a, was a book of substance that also had the physical action. And that's the kind of neat blend that I like in a story. DC's historically put out books like this, and I've always loved them. These uh, these historical tomes that like give us this backstory of things that we didn't know before, and, and just when you think that they've told every story that they could possibly tell, they go and tell one like this. That I referenced on last episode how a lot of what they're doing right now with the world of Amazons is what I loved about the expansion of the Green Lantern lore when they put in the multicolored rings and started talking about the emotional spectrum. 
this is not, again, not cookie cutter to that. But what they've done now is in taking each of the female gods, except for Hera, each of the female gods and having them have their own tribe that is uh, devoted to them of the Amazons, you get this idea of how the Amazons could potentially split off. And yet some of them would stay together. Some of these tribes would interact. And I really loved that aspect of this. Uh, and and this idea that these initial these these initial representatives of each of the gods were then the ones that would kick off the tribe and um, get, learning a lot more about Hippolyta's background in this and how she actually first gets connected with them that she wasn't initially one of them but was somebody who they responded to because this is all about it, it's, it's it's an interesting time to have this be published. Because of the fact that the female gods are all like sitting here saying, hey, listen, we got an issue with mankind. And Zeus is just kind of like matter of factly like, hey, well, we'll just kind of wipe them out with a flood or something like that and start over from scratch and build a better ship. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I'm fine with that. You know, no problem at all. They're like, no, no, no. You don't understand. We're fine with the women folk. It's men. Like, like let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about the guys here. And and I loved that because they were they were talking about a lot of the atrocities and a lot of the violence towards women. And even the way that they were talking about, you know, the, the girl having to prostitute herself until until she earned enough money to be worthy of a suitor. You know, it's like like, what is that? <laughs> I mean, and I loved that they were calling out mankind on some of the historical atrocities and injustices towards women. Saying to Zeus, your idea of what is just versus what is really just, uh, it isn't necessarily adding up here. And it was a really cool debate between the gods that you could see them, they're saying like, listen, we're not having this. Like you can justify your way of handling this all you want to, that isn't working for us. We need something more. We need to take this into a different direction and and make and really make something different with this. To the point that they're like, okay, you're our leader and all that, but you're out of touch. We're not listening. And they have this it's it's it is a rebellion of sorts yeah. that's going on here um, that is creating the Amazons. And I loved that that whole story, again, we see kind of quote unquote see Diana in this, but I love that we've got this Wonder Woman story that I didn't care whether or not I saw her. It was great to see Hippolyta, and I really did need that. Because it was like, okay, now I'm starting to see the connecting threads, and I love that. Because I was enjoying the story leading up to that point. Then you see Hippolyta, and you're like, oh, now they've... You you already had me hooked into this crazy story, but then you bring in Hippolyta this way. Really, like, I wanted to see justice served for Hippolyta, at that point in time, you bring in these other Amazons in that moment. I was like, yes, hoorah, this is what I want. And then you're right, you've got this violence that came out of that. But it was violence that was so emotionally charged at that point that you wanted to see it because the, the guys deserved nothing less. than Because yeah. you knew that they not only had ill intentions, but that they had done this many, many times before. And that was really what they were weighing down on them on, was the fact that, hey, this is something, what they intended to do to her, they've done many a time over, and we're not going to take any more of that. I loved it. I absolutely oh, loved that. Oh, God, yeah. And I'll tell you, you know something, and I'm, as you're talking, I'm just nodding my head saying, yes, yes, that was awesome. And again, they had that beauty of the... Just the the beauty of the the gore, the beauty of the violence, and how it's there's a lot of art teams that can capture. Just there is a pageantry, there is a beauty to you know if you do violence and gore, you could do that in an artistic, beautiful way. And they did a great job with that. But one of the things I really deeply loved was their portrayal and handling of Hera. Oh yeah, because you know this is the goddess of women, you know, and I love how they really explain who she is and what she's doing and why you know she's really angry at men you know because it's not just you know they talk about her she's got the thousand eyes and see everything but she also has the gift well the burden i love how they call it the burden of foresight she sees what's to come as well to the women 
And I love just how, you know, it's not just, you know, current injustice. It's what's going on. It's what's, you know, just the level of, you know, degradation, chatterly, exclusion, entitlement, occlusion, suppression, humiliation, subjugation, assault, murder, you know, just all the things that are going on and just the bases that, that, that portrayal, all the different bases, the, the thousands on millions of bases that she's looking at and all the different events that have happened are going, that have either currently happened or will happen to women that she's seen. And I thought that for me was a really cool, you know, kind of explanation as to what she's seeing and, and her powers and what she can do. And it was, it was just, a, I was like, man, I never thought of Hera in that way. You know, Tara is one of the, uh, with me and, you know, with the gods, I always thought of her as, you know, Zeus's wife, you know, and never really thought of her as her own separate goddess. You know, and a lot of, in most of the stories I've read, she's always portrayed as that, you know, just the wife, just the queen of the gods, but not the goddess of women. And I thought that, you know, this story really did a great job to step her up and say, no, she is a god. And I even love when he's kind of talking down to when Zeus is talking down to them, you know, calling them little birds and this. And it's like, no, we're not birds. We're not animals. We're gods. And I, I really dig that, you know, that band, that that her determination and just that strength of who she is, yeah. you know, that got portrayed in this. So, yes, on everything you said on Hippolyta, that was beautiful. And I love the Amazons rising up and killing, but you got to love just the, you know, the, the long game that Hera is playing, you know, because, you know, when the other goddesses formed the Amazons, she hung back and she hung back because she knows what's coming and she knows what they need. And that's when she takes the little baby and sets it aside to make it, this is going to be Wonder Woman. I though just the her, you know, again, foresight, you know, she knows what's going to happen. She knows what they need. I absolutely love, her, you know, Hera in this story. Yeah, yeah, and it gives a real reason behind what happened there, uh, and and what the gift that she gives to Hippolyta down the road has a far greater meaning. And you're right, foreshadowing was such a great part of this. Hippolyta, in knowing what she was going through, and that she had been part of and put in a position of having to commit an atrocity over and over again, where you know, if you have yet another female birth um, in this village, that it becomes a financial burden on the family who's looking for another male to help earn, as an earner, help with running the family. And the idea that, like, dispose of the extra child, her, her justification of the fact that if I take her down and expose her to the elements, expose her to the dangers, if I expose expose her to disease and she survives she's meant to survive and that's we're leaving it up to the gods and fate and all that and she has this moment of uh, crisis of conscience shall we say where she realizes i just set a baby down a river and this is something i've done you know many many times in many many different forms but this time it's like finally struck me it's like i can't no more no more and she has this no more moment where she goes to save the baby and can't, like does not find the baby and, and is convinced, that, rightfully so, convinced of the point, the baby's dead and there's nothing I can do, but I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep trying to get a force gump moment of sorts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where she just starts taking off and running, um, which led her to run to the point where she was beyond exhaustion, couldn't speak, and that was when she encountered the terrors. But I loved that sequence where you're sitting here going, wow, what terrible times that they live in where financially, you know, you have another kid and it's just a matter of, hey, uh, let's give her to the, <laughs> let's give the baby over to this woman who will dispose of it. That's something nowadays we would, we would scream about when it comes to animals. Uh, back then, it wasn't uncommon to do it with people. Uh, and uh, ew. <laughs> but I, I loved that part of the story where you you get the outrage. It added another level of outrage from the gods and an understanding of why they're like enough is enough. Because this is yet another thing that's being done that justifies their anger. I really, really enjoyed that. Well, yeah, and I like the fact that when after the Amazons, like, you know, again, I'm, I'm right now looking at the battle sequence. Mm -hmm. it absolutely, it's that 
it's a complete full page spread, the kind of the pinwheel circular art design, all encased in red, except for some really good splashes of, you know, the you, where you see the Amazons fighting. I'll tell you, I, I 100% love this thing. This is absolutely beautiful. But I love when after they're done killing the men. And she sits there basically is ready to completely confess to what she's done because she's killed multiple female children, multiple. And she's, you know, it's one of those things that they don't like forgive her, but they do. They give her a chance, a path to forgiveness. You know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people say redemption's earned. You know, and you've got to fight for that redemption. And they're giving her that chance to rise up and fight for it. You know, and actually, you know, take control of it where she did what she had to do, what she was forced to do. But that doesn't define who she is. And I love just how you know it's kind of like that that moment of, you know, again, it's the Amazons not looking down on her, you know, but understanding where she's coming from, not condemning her, not like they could have very easily shamed her saying, you kill women, you know, we're going to kill you, too. You're just as bad as these men. No, they understand the system she's in. They understand the suffering she's uh, had, you know, and it's that kind of, you know, that compassion, that opening they give her that, you know, we get to see the Hippolyta we know, you know, and I, I love that. I'm looking at the page right now with all the pottery, you know, where they were started telling about uh, the human condition, you know, degradation, entitlement, exclusion, subjugation, humiliation, suppression, murder, you know, yada, 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 as they went through. But I really loved that vehicle. Because when you get to zoom in and look at each of those pictures and you see human atrocities, one of the things that I really love about that is you can take a look at today's culture and see elements of pieces of the pottery and you sit there and go, we just got to do better. (laughs) I'm just, you know, just as a culture, I mean, you can look at yourself individually and kind of go, I can be better. And I love that about comics where it's something... There, there is a morality to comics where you can take elements of it. I'm not saying the whole page. I'm just saying you can take like pieces, parts, and go, okay, I can, I can be a little better. I can do a little better. I can step up a bit so that way I don't represent any of this pottery. <laughs> and I liked that. I think it's an interesting element of this story that it's there's commentary here that you can you can really look at. The other thing is I'm looking at the artwork as I'm going through. The character design work, and you were alluding to this before with Hera. I'm looking globally at all the gods and the Amazons. The character work that was done on this is absolutely outstanding. From Zeus to Mercury to, to every one of the female gods to the Amazons as each of them are created... I really enjoyed the dynamic designs. It doesn't conflict with anything I've seen in any other stories before because of the fact that you know these characters evolve and change over time and they morph based on how they're viewed and and as culture views them differently. We've learned a lot about how in the DC Universe the gods are a lot of times um, viewed based on praise or the the worship or... of of the people and sort of morph to the culture that they're currently being representative to, which I thought was kind of a neat storytelling tool that they've put in place before. But man, the character stylings in this, the work and the detail of them, really, really stunning. And there, there's something to be said about that because the, from the costuming to the visual look of them all, there, I mean, woof. <laughs> I mean, I love comic artwork. Every so often, you get these books that, like, you make you go, "Wow, this is spectacular." This is one of those that, again, I'm going to say, if you did not pick this up for any reason, please, I'm not taking anything away from the amazing dialogue in this story. You could pick this up alone right now, just on the artwork. If they took all the dialogue out and just page turn after page turn of the artwork you put the dialogue in you've got this outstanding story so i'm not diminishing at all the writing because the writing is spectacular in this so please let me be clear off of that it's not a knock you take that out though and you look at this artwork it's blows my mind it blows absolutely blows my mind 100 man this again you know this is a really cool story i love this story absolutely 100 percent and the artwork just really kicked it over to a notch. And one of the things I really love mm-hmm. about this artwork, and, and if I haven't expressed this enough, let me for, further say, the gods look like gods, the people look like people, and the Amazons look like 
something else. They're not gods. They're not people. There is a very distinct look and distinct feel to the Amazons. The gods have their this energy to them, you know, that, you know, just re- seems to radiate off the page. And then the people just, you know, every day when it's drawing, just the everyday normal people, you know, they have a look. And you're like, yeah, okay, that's a normal person. Then you get to the Amazons and the Amazons have that special look to them. And I loved how as this goes on, Hippolyta by the end there, she's got that Amazon look to her. That's why I say, you know, Hippolyta looks like the Hippolyta we know. Because if in the beginning she had the, you know, the regular people look, you know, and now, but the, in that last page, she's got that Amazon look to her. Well, she's I absolutely influenced. loved how the art team really did distinguish in these different uh, character classes. Well, you can see how the original, the OG Amazons, were clearly like a hybrid of the gods and their idea of humanity. I think you're nailing that. I think they are something else. And Hippolyta, at the end, has taken elements of that onto her look because of the fact that she's been inspired by them to be something more. Um, she was looking to be something different, to change herself up. She was not, she was really appalled by who she was and what she was doing. And that run, that journey was as much running from who she was to who she, to try and figure out who she could be. Boy, by the end, you're right. She finds it. And man, is it impressive. Um, Cause that, that's page with her on that horse uh, well, it's, it's a horse, but it's a horse yeah. with bones on it. And I mean, she like, I mean, to sit there and craft that together and go like, what can make people really frightened by me when I, when I come running in, believe me, Batman should, can take a, like really take some notes here. <laughs> <laughs> Criminals are a superstitious, cowardly lot. Come in on this horse and like, forget the Batmobile. And I, for me to say, that's hard. You come in on this horse I'm going to notice you, and I'm going to run. <laughs> yep, yeah. Um, oh, God, yeah. I'll tell you, yeah. dude, man. I, I love this page. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, again, is one of those where, you know, you, every so often you get those pages, you're like, that should be a poster. Yes, you know? yes. That should be a poster right there. You know, and I even like the fact that she's holding, you know, and we even saw the Amazons use the lasso. Mm-hmm. So it's not just, you know, something that, that's, it's integrating the lasso into who the Amazons are. You know, and again, it's, you know, we've seen some really cool lasso work with Diana. And, you know, if this, you know, if this is the beginning of the Amazon. So from the very beginning, they're embracing the lasso. They're embracing usage of the rope. And they very effectively <laughs> use the rope to separate a man's head, you know, from his body. So I'm like, that's pretty effective usage of it. So, yeah, study with the lasso. Swords and bows are awesome. But you know what? That piece of rope. You know, in the right hands can do some serious uh, damage. And I like that. And again, this is one of those, again, it's just absolutely wonderful story that, you know, again, reading and rereading and just art read throughs. You know, I've got a couple full read throughs. I've got a couple art read throughs. I've got some stuff where I just go back and I stare at a page for just, you know, a little while going, oh, look at that. And just like the background stuff, the details they put in, you know, any of the any picture of Hera in this book is worth spending a couple minutes just staring at because you know they really Phil Jimenez and the full art team you know, all the colors everybody just went did absolutely absolutely over the top just beautiful work. This is something that I was like, man, this is a this is a thing where you can say this right here. This is flat out art. This isn't a comic book. This isn't a graphic novel. This is art. This is something beautifully created, and I absolutely love that. And even, again, as I said, the capturing just the majesty of the gore and the violence and the beauty, putting the beauty in that as well is something that's just absolutely spectacular. You know, just, again, another page that should be a uh, poster is that the sequence when the Amazons are looking on Hippolyta the first time. It's the our future queen. And you see the Amazons right there with Hippolyta's back to you. you just, that page right there of those Amazons, like, man, that looks awesome as well. This is worthy of Black Label. 
I, I want to be really clear on what I'm saying with that, because Black Label's become this imprint that reminds me so much of the Prestige format. When we got things like Dark Knight Returns, when we got things like Gotham by Gaslight, uh, where there was some really cool experimentation going on at DC with the Prestige format, we were getting these original hardcovers, which we've we've covered some of them on the show. It was, you knew that you would be getting top-notch writers. You would be getting top-notch art teams put together, delivering something that was given the right amount of time to have, and I, there's a key to that, because there's a difference between a monthly book and, and please know, I love and need quality monthly serialized comics. But mixed into that is the experimentation of comics, right? Some things can be and need to be a miniseries. Some things can be these prestige format offerings where its release is going to be a little different <laughs> than yep. everything else. But you know when those issues come out, like the end of book one, this reminds me of Hawkworld originally when that came out, the uh, that prestige format series, redefining the the history of the Hawks. And, and really, each page was like this special visual journey. Um, this, this has those kind of elements in it as well. I love this kind of stuff. And it's, it's really, really important. But having this with a black label imprint on it, it's defining, again, what it means to be a black label book. And DC needs to be really careful on that label. Because when that's on something, it should, and it, it is, I'm, not, I'm loving this label. It's why I'm actually referencing this right now. I find that like everything that's got that black label imprint on it is a must read. And it's a different level of quality. That's not knocking anything else out there. I don't mean it that way. But there should be something that sets black label apart. If they're going to put that label on, it's got to mean something. And they've got to be very protective of that branding. Because I think it's something moving forward... If you want to start targeting a bookstore type crowd again, and what I mean by a bookstore type crowd, I don't know what that looks like now. So I'm, I'm going to be very careful when I say this. But Vertigo for a while had this audience base that wasn't us. And Brian Azzarello said it at a Wizard World Con many, many years ago, where it was a Vertigo panel and basically was saying that, you know, Vertigo, got to be honest with you, isn't targeting you guys. It's targeting. A different audience and he was talking about their collected editions and, and the crowd that they pull in from that this type of delivery this type of book and this type of quality if they market it right and that's something that needs to happen you can pull in a different sort of crowd this is the kind of crowd that is taking college courses around comics where this is the type of material that can keep us moving forward and looking at this as a true art form and again, that's not a knock on any other comics that are out there right now. I think, though, there's always those special ones that like shine a spotlight on the comics and what they really are for people out there. This is that type. This is easily that type of work. This was woof. <laughs> yeah. well, this is a book you can put in the hands of a non-comic book reader. Yeah. And say you will enjoy this. If you've got a friend who enjoys, you know, the fantasy, enjoys, you know, the Greek God stories, that kind of, any, any of that kind of who's into this genre of storytelling. This is a book you can put in their hands and say you will enjoy this. I've got a couple of people at work that I that aren't comic book readers. You know, they like the comic book movies and, you know, they like a couple of, you know, they like this style and this genre. This is a book that, you know, when I get back to work, I'm going to tell them, hey, you know, you want to check this out. This is a book you will enjoy. I know for a fact if they read this, they will enjoy it. And it's one of those things that I'm like, yeah, you know, it's so it's yeah, this is, again, you know, complete high praise to this book. And, and, I'm, and it's funny. I am saying I am. I was surprised at how much I enjoyed this. I thought it'd be neat. Because I am very, right now, huge into the what they're doing with Wonder Woman and the Amazons. And I'm at, like, yes, the Trinity is actually getting its equal dues. Wonder Woman's finally getting her equal dues. You know, and I love that, that you know, they're actually tr treating all three members of the Trinity equal. And they're letting her actually shine. And they're giving her her, pe her and her, her family, her people, the the justification and the time and the pages and just the letting them have this quality story that makes it. Yes. This is why wonder woman is a member of the Trinity. Yeah. And I love that. So I was looking forward to reading this, but this 100% exceeded anything I thought it was going to be to the point where I'm like, this is epic. 
This is you made an interesting point, and I think we'll wrap up with this. You you talked about this being something that you could give somebody who's a non comic reader. And I would say easily, a lot of times there's people who've like enjoyed, my wife, for example, loved the Wonder Woman movies. She's not a comic reader. I would not hesitate to give her this. And my, my, my wife's an avid reader. I wouldn't hesitate to give her this and let her read it. Because here's the great thing about this. You don't have to have read anything to participate in this. There is no background knowledge you need. You could connect this completely with the movies. You know, as far as looking at the history of the Amazons and things like that, you could connect this with comics. It doesn't matter. It's it's one of those stories that, at least book one, right now, let's go. I mean, you can keep going with this. So I, I don't know what book two or... I don't, I don't know how many books this is going to be, actually. I'll, hopefully many. But, yes. uh, but easily, I could give book one to anybody I know right now and, and feel confident that, like, you can just enjoy this as a story. Connect it to Wonder Woman if you have watched the movies uh, or not. Um, it's just, it's a really good story on its own. I think you're right. This this one is one of those that's, you got to know though, I have become a lot more careful on what I give people. I gave comics actually this Christmas to friends of mine who aren't, who have been at various times in their life comic readers, are casual comic readers, or don't, I know don't read comics, but they were books that I knew they would enjoy versus books that I enjoy. And there's a distinction between the two. Because I used to be guilty of, well, I like this, so of course they should have this. I don't do that anymore. I really try to be careful. Like, I've got a friend of mine who really likes westerns, so I gave him Jonah Hex. And it, and I know he will, like, he's read comics growing up and liked the old western comics, and I'm, I'm sure including some Jonah Hex, like the old war comics and stuff like that. So I gave the more modern version of Jonah Hex, you know, those ones that uh, Gray and Palmiotti did. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, well, they, they had that recent hardcover collection that they just put, put yeah. out. So I got that, and I'm like, well, he's going to really like this because you don't need anything else. They're really high-quality stories. I know from talking to him that he's liked that kind of work before. So these will all be things that he hasn't read before, brand new things. And he, I mean, start was paging through it when he was here and wouldn't put it down. So <laughs> I, I was happy because I'm like, okay, I nailed that. I'm trying to be a lot more careful with giving people comic work that I like versus what I know they would like. Because there's so much out there, it's very easy to customize that to a person now. And um, it was it was fun this year giving out comic-related gifts to people who I know wouldn't buy it for themselves, but knowing that the things that I bought were things that were in their tastes, things that they would enjoy. It's good stuff. This is one of them, though. You're right. This this could easily be next year a gift that I'm giving out to certain people because of the fact that I'm assuming by next Christmas this would be available in some form of collected edition, depending on what the release schedule looks like for this. <laughs> we'll see. It might be the year <laughs> after, depending on how... How this one looks, I don't care. They can take as long as they need to to release this one. Please finish it when it's done. Put it out, not before. Yeah. I will be here for every issue of this. <laughs> you do not need to rush this one for me because this is an example of a book that it can't be rushed. Put it out when it's ready. Amen. Look at those strange little beetles. They look great neutron. Our next discussion is on Wonder Girl, issue number six. The writer is Joelle Jones with uh, Le Layla Del Duca uh, as artist, uh, Jordi Belair colorist, Pat Brousseau on uh, letters, Matteo Scalera and Marino D-I-N-I-S-I-O on the covers. Uh, Stanley Art Germ Lau is the variant cover. Jillian Grant is the assistant editor. Brittany Holzer is editor. And Mike Cotton is senior editor. And I probably messed up some names here. So apologies. Uh, <laughs> please pick this up. Yes. If you aren't reading this book, please give it a shot. And because I, I want this to stick around, I have fallen in love with this book. Like six issues in, like I really enjoyed it early on. We've talked, we've talked about this book before and I stand behind everything I said before. I feel a, it even more now as this book's gone on, particularly the writing and the visuals of this book. It's as I'm, we're talking about a monthly book now instead of a prestige format like we were talking about before. But it's everything in that prestige format that I loved about 
the expanded view of the Amazons, lore, mythos, you're introducing another Wonder Girl into the DC universe. You've got to do that in a way where there's substance to it because I like everyone that's come before. I, Cassie, I'm a big fan of. I'm a big fan of Donna Troy. It's if you're introducing a new character like this, you got to make me believe this is necessary and that there's something unique and intriguing about her that's going to make me want to follow this character. Oh my gosh, have they nailed this? Like I wanted to get back to like what what's going on on Earth. We're six issues in and like there's so much in here that I want to happen, like I want to see more of in her world, because I want to see her back. Like we were left hanging on a lot of things, <laughs> in, on, and I love that right now we're still. We're, she's just gotten her costume. She's just kind of figuring out powers. She's just kind of figuring out like this weapon that she's got um, with the bells on the end, things like that. I, I'm, I'm intrigued by her whole journey the pacing could not be better on this because what they've done is they've given us a lot now they're they're taking some time and letting this breathe too often we get this massive jump from ba bam ba bam ba bam ba bam this one there's a lot of content in each issue but it's really really well paced I, I'm getting to know her very, very well through her interactions with others and with situations. I love that I'm on the ground floor of feeling things out with her. I really do feel like I've become a riding buddy with this character very, very early on, and I like her. I, I definitely have become very protective of this character and want to see more, and I do not want her relegated to guest spots. I want her to stay in her own book because I want to. there's so much you can do with this book. And so much, so much storytelling to come out of this. I really am very high on this, and I'm su I'm surprised by that this quickly because we're six issues in, and I'm reading a lot of books right now. And this is a character that I immediately jumped to this book when it comes out, uh, which is unusual considering the amount of books that I'm currently reading. And this is this is a top tier book for me right now. I, I don't know I don't know if you're in the same place, but for me this is one. Woohoo! I'm protective of this book. One of the reasons I am so happy with the Amazon universe. Is is because of this character mm -hmm. because they 100 are doing introducing a new character the way you should do it the way i love it done everything that happened in the past still exists and still is real cassie and don are both are still there they both still have their story they both still have a moniker wonder girl or their own ver versions of it so they have they they still exist they're still real they didn't erase them and change things up they're giving us a new character, giving us a fresh character. You know, this whole – I so love these multiple tribes and the fact that this Wonder Girl is associated with one of the other tribes. And so as we're learning about the other tribes, we're learning about her. She's learning about them. There's so much that, you know, they can do with this story. But on top of it, they've given us this really cool character. She's got her own groove, her own style to her that from the beginning of the, you know, from issue one, you know, we started seeing a different type of hero. And I love that when, you know, she's not just your, dun, 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 I'm going to run into save the day every single time. No, she's got her own groove, how she, how she kind of fell into this. But every time she was presented with doing the right thing or doing the easy thing, she chose the right thing. And that, to me, is a character definition. You know, how many, you know, in the beginning when she, even before she knew she had powers, she ran at an accident to try to save people. You know, when she's faced with uh, Hera, you know, to become Hera's uh, lapdog and kill machine, she's like, ah, uh, no thank you. And she passed and she turns down Hera. You know, it's the, that's like the coolest of who she is. And I absolutely love that about her. Yeah, I do too. Uh, it's and and even so, she's mesmerized, like and in love, and I mean those are pieces that they really captured well. That that hasn't gone away, but the strength of her character and conviction. A lot of times when they do this mesmerizing of characters, they do this thing where they lose all of themselves in the process. She didn't, and and her strength comes through in all that. I think it's more impressive because you know she's been enchanted to the point where he is like irritated that like, this isn't working he's like sitting here you know uh <laughs> you you say you love me but like your actions don't show that and he's trying to use every manipulative trick in the book and it's not working 
she's still clearly enchanted, but it's not working. It's not doing what he wanted it to do, which is this undying loyalty that nothing can come between. And he's not used to that. And I loved seeing that in that moment. There's something very cool about it that tells us a lot about her. More by it's not that because of her powers or because of who she is, it didn't work. It did work. She was not lost in the shuffle. So she is able to still stand behind who she is and make that tough choice of going, listen, I really do love you. This did work. I can't give up everything that makes me who I am, everything I stand for, to be like a prisoner to this endless life of compromising who I am. And I loved that. I mean, it was such a powerful, powerful moment knowing that it worked. Because she's even saying, I didn't refuse you. That's not what this is about. That was so interesting. You see how torn she is because of that. And to me, that's far stronger than it didn't work on me because of some magic power or something like that. That's not what's happening here. Her strength of character, her conviction, her knowing who she is, is what the issue is. It's made me love this character even more than I would have otherwise if it was just kind of, eh, it didn't work, and I'm like Teflon. (laughs) (laughs) I, I thought that was a really strong choice, and I don't you don't see that very often where it's done this way. You know, it's usually kind of some something inherent in their power that they're able to overcome it or something like that. That wasn't what happened here. And I liked that distinction. I liked that difference. There was something to it that just made me like excited. I know. Oh God. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's, I love the banter that we get between her and Eros. As you yeah. said, in at the end there, she does admit that she still loves him. You know, and again, that's the er- his arrows that really are causing it. You know, so it's not a, but, you know, back in the real world, does she have a real love there? And I think that's going to be the interesting thing when, you know, because I'm down the, the, down the line, I'm looking at eventually she's going to make it back to the mortal realm. Eventually she's going to make it back to her guy in the real world. And how will that affect, you know, how will that play out? Because initially she chose arrows over him. And she went with arrows into Olympus and all that stuff. But she was 100% under the influence of the arrow. She's still under the influence of his arrows. And can she break that influence? You know, because I love as what you said, how even though she's under the influence, she's still doing the right thing. You know, and she's not in, and she still admits that she still loves him. And she doesn't see it as a... Uh, you know, being mind manipulator or anything, she truly thinks she's in love with him. And I love that, you know, that she has that, even though she's like, I love you, but I, I got to do the right thing. You know, and I think that is a really cool, you know, status of, you know, a declaration of who she is and what she's about with all this. And I think that's one of the neat things that they do in this story that we get these moments of these great dialogue and these great you know, physical mo- these great moments of her declaration of who she is as a person, as a character, as a hero, and then they splash in with this action and adventure. Yeah. This the creative team is doing a great job of having these great moments, and then you flip the page and a big giant hand smashes in, and she's back into another big fight. You know, and I loved how they kept doing that. You know, from you know the the moments of you know dialogue and clarity and these great character development moments to some really cool action you know that's something that they've done really well in this series that you know up to six issues in they've done a great job of giving us this nice blend of character growth and development and physical action and it's you know it's a beautiful blend i love when you see the fight with the giant and you see that she's trying to reason with it saying listen my beef isn't with you i'm not mad at you but the combat ingenuity like going for the heel And, you know, realizing, okay, I need to cut him down to size a bit. And I thought that move of, like, dodging and then going for the heel was really great. You know, smacking him in the head and trying to reason with him. And there is no reasoning, and he starts pummeling her. And you see that she doesn't quite know how to use that rope-like object that she's got yet. That we learn for the first time that there's an emotional component to it. Like, when she taps into it, that's when the thing starts to be used. I like that she's discovering things along the way organically. 
that makes a lot of sense because there wouldn't be any training of that yet. That hasn't been something, you know, that has happened because of the events that we've seen in the story. Then Jerry showed up on the scene. And I <laughs> Jerry. I love Jerry the horse. Uh, the majority the uh, Jerry Pegasus. The, the, the Pegasus horse, right. Coming and flying on the screen. And and she's like sitting here hugging. He got this relationship. I like that the horse has his personality. I'm like, listen, we're not in that place yet, babe. <laughs> 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 like, I'll help you and all that. But uh, I'm not even quite sure how much I actually like you here. <laughs> and I loved that kind of attitude and personality as well. And seeing that relationship develop, which was a clever choice, because sometimes they they jump to all of a sudden the you know, the sidekick animal or whatever having yeah. like this automatic relationship. And I like that the horse has a little bit of an attitude. <laughs> like that was a clever when choice. When she's sitting there talking about how she threw the bull around the neck, and then I said, then I said something really cool. Yes, like it's about time to wrap things up, you know. And he just you know does the snort and they that look at the <laughs> horse face like, yeah, right. He's like, really, I did. You know? Yes, I, I, that little funny dialogue. It reminds me of like you know Frozen, you know, with the uh, the reindeer or yes. um, you know the Rapunzel story, you know, with that one horse, the guard's horse. Yes, you know how that guard's horse had that person. That's the kind of stuff that's popping in my head with this. And that's one of the things I like about her because these kind of moments, these yes. are some fun moments, you know, but it doesn't take away from, you know, anything of the coolness. Of her. I really like her as a character. I like her as a person. I like her as a hero. I like that she does step up, but I do like these fun moments. Well, it's a stronger and part it, of the yeah. cinematic universe as well, right? You know, our, yeah. our movies have that balance too, where, it's, you know, it's not about being slapstick because it's not that. It's humor at the right point in time. You need to inject a variety of emotions to make this feel three-dimensional. And those emotions do that. So I, everything you're saying, I'm just not. And I agree with you. This this is, there's there's a lot of character to this story. Like, Jerry can't go anywhere. Jerry needs to be a part of this book going forward. Like, in some way. I'm not saying, maybe not every issue, maybe when appropriate to whatever missions. But... Jerry needs to be a thing, right? I 100% agree. We need more Jerry. Yeah. You know, we need more Cowbell. We need more Jerry. <laughs> you know, and, you know, he, great character. Yes. And it's funny. I want to know, is there something more to Jerry than what, what meets the eye? Because this is Olympus. So that sure. may not be an actual Pegasus. That may be somebody else, you know, a, you know, in a Pegasus, uh, you know, disguise, you know, or a Pegasus form or something like that. So I don't know. It's, you know, you never know what's going on, but I agree with you. Jerry needs to stick around. You know, again, if, if they, if they decide not to have Jerry around, okay. But I think it, it, it'll be a big mistake. So I loved the ending bit with Donna Troy and Cassie, where Donna's like, it's okay that you didn't tell me about any of this. And it's the, the opportunity to learn more about this tribe and actually get a chance to understand what drives them. You know, Cassie makes this optimistic point, crazy to be excited about this, what this could mean if everything works out. And Donna's like, you know, I think it's also crazy that you're not thinking about what happens if it doesn't. <laughs> that was such a great sequence of events because they're charging onto this and this could go really well or this could go horribly wrong. What we know is... She's on the other side of the door, right? Are they, is that the same door that she's at? I, it, to me, it looks like, yeah, they're on either side of the same door. Right. Which I think is kind of neat because I want to see, you know, what ha it's one of those things, I want to see what happens next. You know, when they go through or when she goes through. But then again, we do have those mysterious figures. Right. You know, and I, I love immediately, she's like, okay, it's go time. And she's ready for battle. Even Jerry gets ready to fight. You know, this is, you know, again, this is the kind of stuff that they're building on us. They keep giving us glimpses of these people, you know, and they are the they are the bad guys. You know, and I did air quotes around bad guys because, to be honest, we don't 100 percent know who they are. I'm assuming they're the villains. I'm assuming they're evil. You know, I'm assuming they're the bad guys, just the way that you look at them. But who knows for certain? And I think that's the neat thing about this. Odds are, yes, these are going to be the villains. But maybe there's going to be a swerve, and we're not going to see that swerve coming. You know, I don't know. And I think that's one of the neat things about this character, about this story. I'm not 100% certain on anything. And I think that, for me, is the absolute joy in this. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's an that's an important piece of this too. Is I'm not certain either. I don't know. Here's the thing: I don't know. Are all three of them villains? Is one somehow related to her? Is you know? I mean, there's I have lots of questions, and I love the mystery. The mystery of this has been an intriguing piece as well. At every issue of this, I this is this is a series that I'm really, really, really glad to see out there. Hey, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. You know, you flip the page. And we see this 12-part weekly Batman event that's coming out, yep. starting in Detective Comics. Yes, please? Yeah, I know, man. <laughs> the Shadows of the Bat thing? It's yeah. like, yeah, bring this on. You know, please, more of this. Um, I, I'm, woof. This year is, 2021 has been a great year for comics, which it's a testament to all the comic creators out there, um, a testament to comic shop owners, a testament to comic fans. The fact that, you know, getting over the hurdle of what was very ugly with COVID, I'm not saying COVID's gone, but I'm saying at least getting to the point where we're comics and everything's starting to get a little bit back on track. I'm loving the output that we're getting right now. And I'm finding now more than ever, I really need my comic book reading output. It's, uh, I was saving this kind of for the end. I've been reading and, um, it's there's a there's a DC tie to this even though I'm going to talk real quickly about a Marvel book. I've been reading the original Spider-Man Clone Saga, which Jerry Conway, who was a a major writer for not just Marvel but also for DC along the way historically, wrote in uh, the se- in the seventies. And it, I never read the original Clone Saga. I read excerpts of it. I read recaps of it, but I never actually read all of the issues that encompass that. So I, I had picked up a, a trade paperback that collects not only that, but then some later issues from Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man from 79 on. That was done by Bill Mantlo, and who I loved from Micronauts back in the day. So I'm reading that right now, and it's like 500 pages, and I've only got like 100 left. That was been like my week, my Christmas read this week. I was kind of going through and doing that. I'm finding I'm doing this weird balance of, um, and it's a good balance, of reading in three categories. I'm reading the new books and loving them. I'm reading some books that I've read before but have wanted to revisit. I'm still making my way through the deluxe editions of Sandman and Fables right now just because I'm really enjoying those reads. And then I'm going and reading some classic stories from DC and Marvel that I haven't read before that are ones that I've always wanted to get to. This was one, it's a story I've always wanted to read. And Jerry Conway is just a just a great writer. Boy, does it hold up. And I'm going to be, I'm jumping from this, I'm going to do a DC story next, because I'm, I'm flipping between the two. I don't know what I'm, I'm going to next, because I've got, a, I've got a quite a list of backlog stuff that I haven't read. But I'm, I'm going for things that are big stories, that are big runs, that I haven't read before. The Spider-Man one's intriguing to me because of the fact that as a kid I was reading Marvel Team-Up. And this story references some Marvel Team-Up issues that I did read. But I was not... I didn't have the budget to be reading Marvel Team-Up and Amazing Spider-Man. I had a subscription to Marvel Team-Up that came to my door. I didn't read Amazing Spider-Man except if I got like a broken issue here and there in those three packs we've talked about before. So I didn't get a chance to read those. It's the same thing with DC books like Batman. It's I there was there's some collected editions of Tales of the Batman by Jerry Conway. I didn't read those issues because during that time I was reading Brave and the Bold. So I'm now going to go back and read those Tales of the Batman Jerry Conway books that I've got. And uh, I'm kind of on a Jerry Conway kick. And it's funny, the Spider-Man book led me into, well, I want to read some of Jerry's DC work <laughs> now. Let's jump from this onto that and read some of the Tales of the Batman stuff that he did. But it was cool. It's it's interesting to read that stuff. And boy, they were doing some high-end stuff in the 70s in comics that still holds up today, which that was surprising for me. And that's why I'm referencing it here at all. It was Jerry's work over there. Is now I want to read Jerry's Batman work. What was he doing um, in Batman at that time that I haven't read yet? Or if I have, you know, it was an issue here and an issue there versus being able to read the run. Um, that stuff is intriguing. Are you going back? I know we've with the DC app and everything like that. Are you finding yourself reading more current stuff or reading older stuff? Or what? how are you kind of navigating your reading right now? Because I know, like me, you got a backlog of current books that you're reading. And, and I'm in the same boat where it's, 
you know, you do your daily kind of reading stuff. Are you reading any older material? And if so, how are you, like, what what makes you prioritize something that you want to read right now that's not current, if you do do that? Uh, well, if I'm not reading current stuff, it's DCN. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, because, you know, again, I'm paying for it, so let's, you know, it, it's, I've got the resource there, let's use it. And sure. it's something I'm like, that's something I've, I've kind of started embracing more of, I'm like, I've got this, I should use this, yeah. and I'm not using it, you know, and, you know, and there was a lot of times when I was looking at books saying, you know, that looks kind of interesting, let me pick it up, and I'm like, wait, why am I picking up when I can read it right here, and that's been something I've been doing, I'm picking, reading the older stuff based on, you know, actually more on based on character, I'm kind of in a, I've been in a Wonder Woman and a Superman kick, where mm. I'm going back and reading older stuff for them. You know, just, you know, again, as I said, I've recently, I've really started appreciating Wonder Woman. And I've really started, you know, saying, man, I should have been reading, I should have been reading this back when I was a kid. I would have loved this stuff back when I was a kid. And I'm reading stuff back when I was in high school, you know, and that I, you know, I'm like, man, if I wish I'd read this when I was in high school, because this is an awesome story. That kind of stuff is where I'm going through. And I'm just keep on, I keep going with the uh, action comics. I want to, go back, you know, and keep going back and back. And I, I'm kind of, I pick like a segment and I go, I start reading here, then I read forward. Then I go back and I read forward. And that's kind of how I'm reading action comics. Are you doing like, for the Wonder Woman, are you looking, are you reading the Perez reboot stuff or are you going before that? I, I, I done the Perez reboot just because, you know, I know you've mentioned it and multiple people have mentioned how wonderful it is. I'm like, oh, let me, let's do this. You know, but I want even, bef I'm trying to go even before that. I'm trying to go, I, I want to basically. I want to have a full knowledge on the Wonder Woman stuff. Cool. Yeah, it's because it's, it's. I started really becoming a Wonder Woman fan with the Perez reboot, uh, just because I was a big fan of his with Teen Titans, and that's what it was. It was following him from Teen Titans. Like, oh, he's gonna do Wonder Woman now. That's gonna be cool. And it was. It became a natural jumping on point. But like you, I I didn't. I wouldn't say that was my first exposure to reading Wonder Woman. I read Wonder Woman before that, but it really was. If I ended up getting a Wonder Woman issue, either in a box from a flea market or from three packs, it wasn't, I wasn't reading it consistently. So it's, yeah, as you read stuff, if you, if you find things that are worth noting, bring them up on the show just because uh, I'm saying that just as much selfishly for me as I am. <laughs> I'm saying it for our listening audience as well. But uh, I, and I, I do think if, I feel like if it's something that is intriguing to talk about on the show, it would be really good for, um, I'm always looking for new things to read and I know our listening audiences as well. And I encourage people listening to this, feel free to email us or call in if there's books that you're reading current or past that you want to point out and shout out. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. And, uh, don't be afraid to, uh, post them. Or if you want to post them in our Facebook group, um, it's, uh, I'll pull stuff from there too. If you, you know, want to start a thread up there and just say, Hey, I was reading this recently. And, uh, could you guys shout it out on the show? Uh, I'll be happy to do that. I think, um, that stuff is really neat. And I think there's something important to getting the word out about books that people should be reading, especially with these apps. You make an interesting point there. It's I, I want to get enough value out of uh, this app. I I found it to be immensely valuable. It's funny as I open it up right now and I'm like, where am I at right now? Um, I've got Robin's issue number three is the next thing queued up to read. So I know that's current, but um, I like the original stuff like that as well that's coming out of the app. It is. I do find myself using the app weekly. And so the renewal was easy. It was a no-brainer for me. Because when I, when I look at that and um, I know I'm reading enough out of it that it's worth it. But you're right about the value of just getting something and not... I'm finding that with streaming services that I'm looking this year in 2022 to really pay attention to what streaming services I'm watching and getting a lot of value on and which ones I'm forcing myself to watch. Right. Because I've got... I'm trying to make myself get value out of it. Just because I want to pare back a little bit. The app actually has, there's a, bo there's a book I want to recommend to people that you may have missed, Far Sector. Far Sector, they just released issue 12 on the app. If you missed that miniseries, it's a really good Green Lantern story. And did you read all of that one, Jim? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. yeah that was a good one, man. I'm noting it because of the fact that I'm actually going to probably reread it on the app because I, li I read it through once and I'd like to go back through and read it again because I really enjoyed it. There's some really good stuff on there to read. They're up to issue nine 
on Rorschach, which is which was another terrific series coming over there. There's a lot of really good things on the app right now that you can read. One thing I am reading over there is the past, and I'll end with this. I'm starting to read Icon and Static, the older books that are available on the app, because I've become a fan of the season one of these characters that they've been doing for Milestone. I did not have the budget to read a lot of Milestone back when it was out. And I've heard nothing from, from some of our listening audience. I've heard nothing but good things. And uh, I, I'm really enjoying going through and reading this on the app. It's something that I've missed. And I'll, I'll update regularly on, on what that looks like. But uh, some really, really good stuff. The app, the, the app is a good thing. Yep. Now I can get out of here. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's one 388 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the podcast. Uh, RagingBullets at gmail.com is our email address. You prefer to contact us that way. We have a website, RagingBullets.com. It feeds into our Twitter and Facebook fan page. We are proud to be part of a really cool Facebook group community. And I go there regularly to see news and different articles and things that people post. It's also a great place if you want to post anything you want to talk about on the show, if you want to shout out any podcasts or blogs that you are a part of. Um, I look at that as an open community, and I want to thank everyone there for making it such a safe and open community to be a part of. The About Us section of our show website is where you find out how to get with us on uh, other social media and gaming platforms, so we want to connect with you and really appreciate you. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Segulin, what's going on over at DCBService.com? Well, we have the four-issue limited series, New Champion of Shazam! 40% 40% off, only two thirty nine, And we have the Monkey Prince, a 12-issue limited series, issue one, 40% off, only two ninety nine. Thank you, DC Desk. And InStockTrades.com, they have the Fables Compendium 4 trade paperback, fifty nine ninety nine, regularly 42% off, only thirty four seventy nine. And I want to shout out once again the very special book. I'm a big fan of this one, the Bequest trade paperback. This is by Tim Seeley and longtime friend of the show, Freddie e. Williams II. Sixteen ninety nine regularly, thirty percent off, only eleven eighty nine. This is a great way to get the whole mini series in one really cool collected volume. And I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. I want to wish everyone because uh, our show, our next episode will be in twenty twenty two. I want to thank everyone for supporting the podcast and wish you both and I oh, wish you both wish wish you all. <laughs> we only got two listeners. But I want to wish both yes. of them a happy new year. And I want to wish you all uh, sincerely a very happy new year and a safe new year. And let's hear it for 2022 and hopefully for all of us uh, a much the path to a much more normal year, shall we say, as yeah. the year goes on. Uh, that's fingers crossed uh, for 2022. But thank you for listening to us and making us a part of uh, your 2021. I'm looking to continue weekly in 2022, Jim. We we up yes. for that challenge? We're, we're going to continue weekly? I think we can do it, man. I think we'll, we'll rock it out and maybe even do a little bit more than weekly. Yeah. Well, we did it. Actually, we did in 2021. We did a lot of the uh, pop culture and whatnot episodes that were in between. So uh, we could certainly do that again in 2022. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I like having us back with a regular schedule. And our numbers have shown that our listening audience does, too. So thank you very much for that as well. Our next episode, Jim and I are going to talk about a couple of things we haven't talked about. First of all, Green Lantern. It's time. Jim shouted this one out. It's time to talk about Green Lantern again. So we're going to talk about Green Lantern. And we're going to touch base on this DC versus Vampires miniseries. We will see you next week. Bye! All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I right, sure we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim!
Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim? Jim? Jim! Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, no, that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't... I didn't mean to buy that. I didn't mean to buy that. Sean, Jim, how long do you want the song to go? Look, it's all for